Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Woosa. I hope everybody is having a mellow, low or no stress day. How are you guys doing? I'm Fantastic. Pretty chill. Yeah. Indubitably. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully everyone is much more chill this week than last week. Yeah, we've had a week to think through everything that went down in crypto land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And price is kind of starting to stabilize a little bit. Hopefully emotions are stabilizing too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, this is, I think, just the perfect time to do a show all about the mental side of trading and investing. A lot of people got a wake up call, you know, when you have six months of well, I guess more than six months of just amazing gains, both in the stock market and the crypto markets. It's easy to get complacent. It's easy to get overconfident. It's easy to think you're a genius when everything's going up. But the goal is to survive the bear markets so you can thrive in future market cycles. Exactly. Yeah. So we don't even know if this is truly a bear market at this point. All we know is we've had a pretty deep pullback in Bitcoin and also a lot of cryptos and some growth stocks have gotten hit. But uh, yeah, talk to us, guys. How are you guys doing out there? Um, looks like we had somebody say, um, where did it go? Things are so less much stressful, so much less stressful compared to the previous two times watching this show live. Awesome. That's our goal is to help you develop your mindset, your skill set, and uh, yeah, be able to knock it out of the park. So what do you guys want to talk about on the mental side? I actually, let's do this. Before we jump into charts and all that stuff, I feel like there's there are two books that are required reading for every trader and investor. Uh, the first one is Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas. You know, people always ask me, Chris, what are the best trading books? And everybody wants like a technical analysis book, but really like TA books aren't that great because it's just theory or it's outdated shit that doesn't work. Where the mental side is usually the part that the most amount of people are missing that they need. And so Trading in the Zone is a good one because it teaches you the how and why your brain works the way it does and kind of like how to reprogram it. And then the second book is by our good buddy, Jared Tindler, The Mental Game of Trading. And Jared actually just today did a class to our wealth building community, answering questions and just talking through some of the, I guess, the the major things that people have gone through recently. And, you know, he, he, his book, which he just released last month, and I'll shill these books every single day of my life because I think, that, again, this should be required reading for anybody that's in the markets. Um, but the nice thing about the mental game of trading is it takes some of the theory that you can learn in trading in the zone and it gives you practical application. Like, okay, what do you actually do with the knowledge once you know it, right? What, what do you do? How do you develop your skill? How do you get over fear, greed, tilt, you know, overconfidence, discipline, stuff like that. Um, so I don't know, where should we take it from there? What do you guys want to talk about on the mental side? Nikki, I know you have developed a whole course around this and you're basically the, the kind of the mom, uh, <laughs> mental coach for the community, but I will uh, take that. I yes. will take that title <laughs> happily. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I've been spending a lot of time reading the mindset chat in the community and I'm just so proud for one to see how people are coming to revelations going through the hard stuff but they're using it as lessons you know to improve them further instead of being so down on themselves and beating themselves up saying okay here's what happened here's what i wish i would have done or didn't do or, or did do yeah and here's my takeaway from it and they've been bulleting out their takeaways and you know uh the lessons that they're going to now be able to improve their trade management even better in the future. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud to see that some of the what I thought we could do was go through some of the main troubles that people were having and kind of talk through each one, mm -hmm. how to avoid it in the future, things like that. I don't know. How does that sound? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Some of the things that we saw. I guess both in our community, also maybe on social media, because crypto Twitter is just a cesspool of emotion. And, you know, when the, when prices fall, everybody sl starts slinging mud at each other. And you see people blaming influencers like, hey, Elon, I, you know, I lost money because you or 
you know, different traders or investors that put out charts. There are even guys that were like deleting some of their prior tweets and calls and stuff like things just get weird when prices fall, but they're equally as weird when prices are going up because everybody thinks they're a genius. Right. Yeah, okay. So how do you handle both sides of that? Yeah. Uh, and we're, we're, well, I was going to say that's going to be one of the things that we're going to touch on mm -hmm. in a bit, but go ahead answer away. How do you handle that? Yeah. If you have an answer. Go to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Just close your laptop, disconnect it, and say whatever happens, happens, I'm done. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. It is funny to think about, you know, if you had gone into the woods and, or, you know, gone somewhere without, you know, maybe gone into a coma. Service. That, that, you know, that's the dark way to put it. If you, you know, disappeared for a couple months without internet access and then you came back, you know, to either crypto recently, right, you would... You would have missed all that and you'd be like oh yeah price is down a little bit from the highs but like you would you wouldn't really notice it that much right like the 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 amount of consternation and fear and yelling and emotion that happens on these dips is is incredible it happens in stocks too we actually saw the same thing in stocks in call it late February through probably like early May. And now some of the growth stocks are starting to come back. Some of the SPACs that have done deals are starting to start to bubble up again. And people's portfolio values, I think are stabilizing a little bit, but you know, there's just, there's so much, there's so much noise. And, and in that noise, you can get easily wrapped up. And so what you have to do is you either have to take a break or you have to take a longer term perspective and once you go through some of these cycles you'll realize that a lot of this is just not helpful like worrying about the minute to minute the hour to hour the day to day it's also true as a fundamental guy in stocks when there's always news pieces there's always analysts downgrading or upgrading the stocks in my portfolio you have to be able to tune out the noise it's a skill set that you got to get better at over time and realize what is worth reacting to because there are things that are worth reacting to. Yeah. You're not just gonna zen on everything. <laughs> when something fundamental is like significant and it and it requires a change, you wanna pay attention to that. But there's a skill set that you wanna develop over time, which is tuning out all the noise, being that, you know, like having that capability of tuning out what's just day to day noise and then being able to differentiate that from what's truly meaningful. Great point. Yeah. Well, I don't one know thing, if I answer that well, but no, no, no that's yeah, great. That's signal from the noise. If I had to summarize what I was trying to say there, being able to separate the signal from the noise. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing I just want to point out before we move on is last week's show, the title and, and the, the main focus was all about price because Bitcoin was crashing and we had like... 10 times the amount of people on the live stream then than we do today because when people hear like oh the mental game a lot of people tune it out because they think they either a don't need it or b it's boring and so they're not going to pay attention a lot of newbies are like shut the hell up and just tell me what price is going to exactly. do right but as we've seen in the community and like just have been teaching this stuff for so long one thing i've noticed is the people that do put the time into learning the mental game and like trying to hone their mindset they do obviously way 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 better than the people that are like oh just tell me when to buy and sell because i could even send trade alerts and tell people exactly what i do every single time but people are still going to screw that up if it a doesn't fit the risk tolerance or B they don't have the mental fortitude to know what I'm doing and why, and then like be able to hold through drawdowns and things like that. So the mental side is absolutely crucial. So I just want to commend you guys that are here today because talking about the mental stuff is not the sexy part of investing, right? But it is that piece that if you don't get right, you're probably going to fall into the 90% of people that lose money, right? So a lot of the people that instinctually or emotionally came to last week's class to find out what we were doing or, you know, what price was going to do next. And then they tune out when we start talking about the mental stuff. Those are the people that are way more likely to fall flat on their face. So I just want to commend you guys that are here today because I think yeah, it's important. That's a good point. I always say that um, investing, trading and investing is 80% mental and 20% you actually making the decisions to buy and sell, yeah. you know, pressing the buttons. And I think a lot of people think it's just the non-sexy vegetables and they can make money and be geniuses without it. And it's just not the case as the people that are in our community are learning yeah. the importance of it. Um, but one of the main issues that people had was dealing with the fact that they didn't have enough dry powder or 
capital on the sidelines to take advantage of the dip. Mm. So I figured that might be a good one to address because I think in the stock world, March 2020, we were probably off. You could never have enough money when, when the market is doing something like that usually. Right. Um, but that's a good place to start, I think. Yeah. And we should we should maybe open this up too. Like if you guys have any mental issues or anything that are in the live chat that you want to post in there, feel free to post them and we'll get to them in a minute. But yeah, I mean, so how do you handle like if you if the market crashes big and you don't have dry powder or you don't have capital left to buy travel do you what would you say to somebody like that uh 10x leverage no i'm kidding <laughs> no i kid i kid absolutely not uh i think you you can definitely still make moves within your portfolio assuming you're not you know accessing a little bit of leverage or something like that then you there's still shifts you can make within your portfolio and that's something that we did in march 2020 with our stock portfolios was we took a hard look and we said from here at these new price levels what makes the most sense from a risk reward perspective which positions do we want to make larger because the reward to risk is just insane and you know especially with the companies that we knew were going to survive that had stronger balance sheets using that uh, that to guide us um, helped us to you know make sure we didn't make dangerous positions bigger and we would potentially even reallocate like i sold a bunch of stocks that i thought might have some balance sheet risk at the kind of the early stages of that march crash and reallocated to some stocks that had strong balance sheet net cash on the balance sheet that i knew were going to survive and would eventually be much bigger in time so that being able to shift within the portfolio now in the context of crypto that's probably a question for you is like how would you how would you think about that maybe it's moving from alts to you know, Bitcoin or depending on the conditions, but yeah. So I realized that altcoins in general or, or on average are way more volatile on a percentage basis than Bitcoin. Bitcoin's already volatile as hell, but that's a crazy thought. That yeah. Alts are more, alts are way more, volatile. you know, and that's why, like, if you're chasing yield, if you're looking for big gains, you can find it in altcoins, but it's a game of hot potato. It's like, you don't want to be the last one at the altcoin party. Cause that most of them go to zero. You know, how many times have I said that over the past few years, most of them die. Um, and the ones that don't, they over time underperform Bitcoin anyway. Um, but in the middle of a bull cycle, you might have Bitcoin that goes up, say 500%. You might have some altcoins that go up several thousand percent, right? So you can grow your account quicker trading altcoins than Bitcoin. But again, it's a game of hot potato. So when we were near the highs, um, I started selling altcoins a lot heavier earlier than I did Bitcoin. So like if we take a look at the chart, you know, I, I basically sold, this was the day that I was very public. I sent trade alerts. I even tweeted about it. Like, Hey guys, I'm, I'm unloading a lot of positions and this was Bitcoin on like the right shoulder. But there's a reason why I closed ETH where I did, which was basically the exact top. Now, again, my goal is not to close the exact tops, but sometimes it just happens that way. And, and literally as price was doing a, a pull in a green to red move here around 4,100, that's where I sold a lot. And the reason for that is, again, all the technical reasons, all the market sentiment reasons, but it was also my portfolio. I know that on average, ETH and everything smaller than ETH is usually going to pull back much deeper on a percentage basis than Bitcoin. So that, I guess like where you guys rotated capital in March of 2020 from underperforming or higher risk stocks to higher performing or, or higher probability stocks, I took profit across the board, but I took even more off of the altcoin positions and took graceful exits on some and just realized like when the music stops, when the DJ, which is Bitcoin, stops the music all the drunk party goers which are everybody that are so high high on all these altcoin gains they see 70 80 90 percent drops like that so mm -hmm. you've got to expect that but you were also thinking about two other things you were thinking about would you regret not taking profit if it did tank because you knew that that was a possibility you were yeah. looking at all sides yeah poss possibilities and probabilities we preach it all of the time you were doing that and then on top of that, you were looking at the actual dollar amount and how that would change your financial situation. Yeah. And it helped you make a much easier selling decision yeah. by doing all of those things. It's not just like one thing. 
that's that's what people have to understand yeah you can't just look at price and be like oh yeah okay boom i know exactly what i'm going to do so you know there are multiple things that go into play yeah to to make that final selling decision yeah well and one thing that people can see like in my previous watch lists and stuff from a couple months ago i was over 95 percent invested like of my crypto portfolio i I had less than five percent in cash that i could have bought dips with and i was telling people i'm like i'm really heavily invested right now so at the higher prices go the more paranoid i get where i'm like all right at the higher prices go the more cash i want to accumulate for those dip buy opportunities and then i got to i can't remember the exact number maybe it was a quarter or a third of my portfolio into cash before the crash and that gave me um gave me confidence to where like i could start buying dips if things did pull back if they kept going great i'm still gonna have trend riders but in the event of a deep pullback which we got i am really happy i have that cash so you recognized that your cash position was low yeah and you sold to bolster that just in case because of all the other signs you were seeing on top of that yeah right yep and then so like the mental side and the portfolio like management they go hand in hand right Mm -hmm. it's like i was getting that spidey sense and and feeling uncomfortable and i i didn't want to ignore that and just like no i'm just getting richer every day i'm obsessing over my portfolio going up how can i possibly sell when prices are going up no that's I'm thinking, where people go wrong yes they do the that's opposite where they go of that wrong. if you are not feeling uncomfortable as price is moving higher and as your pnl is getting larger then then you need to be thinking to yourself crap am i getting greedy here yeah like you should be thinking that as and become more and more afraid I know that we were yeah in, when the market went ham and PLs felt too good to be true and percentage moves felt too good to be true we were like crap yeah let's think about this we for were a scaling second. out that's yeah. another way that I think you help to deal with not only this we talked about scaling in and scaling out a lot in this podcast about how that helps us minimize regret we're trying to capture the meat of these moves we're not trying to be perfect right um, that also not only does it help to minimize regret but it also helps position you counter to the market so that you are lightening up and increasing your cash position hopefully as things are going up and then that's that gives you the dry powder to be able to buy the dips so that you don't end up in a situation where you're zero percent cash at all time highs then it corrects and then you still you know you don't have any excess cash right yeah so the, the scaling out strategy as things are going up and up and up is actually something that should help you have some cash buffer when the dips come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, when those dips come, if they did catch you off guard and you and you don't have excess cash, well, there's obviously things you can do externally. Try to, you know, earn extra income. Try to, you know, make bigger contributions over the next couple months. Transfer you know, you... cash in from a savings account if you mm-hmm. have the extra cash, you know. Yeah. Yep, yep. I mean, it's okay to add cash to your portfolio if you found yourself running dry i mean you want to be careful and you want to make sure that you're not chasing bad price uh, Mm -hmm. and you're doing it at the right times but that's not a terrible thing if you see a huge opportunity i mean a crypto pullback like this i would say that's a huge potential opportunity that people haven't seen pullbacks like this in a while yeah so i would say that might be one of those reasons to say I think I want to take advantage of this. And yeah, and and also talking about like deep pullbacks, um, people have to be really careful about how they process information coming from social media, like the especially popular narratives. Like one that happened this time that I hadn't seen before was institutions are here; they're not going to let Bitcoin and crypto prices crash, and that became so prevalent on crypto Twitter. I was like people are going to get their faces yeah. ripped off. Like, no, that's institutions bad. are not here to protect the downside. Like, that's not how they think. That's not how they operate. If anything, if I was sitting on a few billion dollars that I knew I wanted to get in Bitcoin, they're probably thinking, how can we inject FUD into the market to make prices crash? And actually, we've seen evidence of that over the past couple of weeks. I'm not pointing any fingers, but there's a lot of accusations floating out there. But like, if you ever find yourself on the popular side of some kind of narrative like that, where it seems almost irrational, then it might make sense to take the counter trade of that or to think, why could the mass majority of people be wrong? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think in terms of 
you know, to kind of close the cash position conversation, I think that it depends on your trading style because I get this question a lot, like how much cash should I have? Yeah. You know, and you have to think about your cash as uh, not only kind of a hedge, you know, to kind of help you out if you're in a situation where you uh, need to take the opposite side or you or you see a dip and you, you want to take advantage of it to kind of help against the losses by averaging down or something like that. But um, I think you need to look at your trading strategy to figure out how much cash you should have on hand because traders are going to have more cash in their in their portfolio to take advantage of the shorter term, you know, naturally, that's just the way it goes. Traders have bigger cash positions than investors. Yeah. Investors are usually investing for the long haul. Their cash positions are just naturally going to be smaller. So one thing I mentioned in the community recently was think about at any time if the market sells off, how how many positions can you enter with your cash position? How many en positions do you want to be able to enter with your cash position? I know for me at all times, especially with the stock market, with earnings, gap downs, big gaps in price all the time, I always wanna be prepared to at least be able to enter a few positions that are like fully sized in my opinion. Yeah. So thinking about your portfolio in that way, if something happens, how many positions do you want to be able to have the ability to enter into? I don't know. It's kind yeah, of my yeah. framing. I, I like thinking it. of it like that too. And also you can think of like your investment capital as a pie. Like I have part of that, which is cold storage, right? Never touch it. Stack sats, put it away. Long term, I don't really care what the price is. I just accumulate during accumulation ranges. Then kind of the, the reason why we trade is to build our Bitcoin and cash positions. Like, uh, you know, to anybody who's in the HODL crowd, which I know a lot of newbies get kind of sucked into this, where it's like, oh, just buy and HODL. Well, in theory, that's great. But when prices crash 70, 80, 90%, most of the people that claim to have strong hands end up capitulating and selling the lows. Ask me how I know that. I've been here since 2013, and I've heard from thousands of people that have admitted that they've done that. So how do you not do that? Well, you actively trade, you set profit targets, you get in and out. And I can tell you today, I have way more money because I actively trade than I would if I just bought and held my original 2013 Bitcoins, right? And there's also this popular narrative in the crypto space, which is don't trade, just hodl, right? And that's the whole like, how strong are your hands? I won't sell if you won't sell thing. And that's what causes these crashes in the first place. Yeah. So the people puking basically. Yeah. Because they thought they, they can't were hodling, take the pain but anymore. They can't. And yeah. that's the other thing. A lot of people had a difficult time seeing their portfolios decline, what, mm. 50%, 50, 60%, yeah. depending on what you were holding. Which is just oh. another a normal day in crypto. <laughs> you know? Is it though? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, a normal day? Yeah. I mean, look, every market cycle, there have been multiple instances of 50% crashes over a, the, a span of a handful of days. And that's where we just get juicy and, and greedy, right? Like mm -hmm. that's what we love. 2013 happened, 2015 that happened, uh, 2018 and 19 that happened, 2020 it happened, right? Like we get those opportunities all the time. But if you're just somebody who's like, I'm gonna hodl and then you buy it high and you're taking a deep drawdown and you don't have cash waiting on the sidelines, you're gonna not be able to get your cost basis lower. Well, what do you say? I know what I would say, but what what do you say to the people that had a hard time seeing their portfolios draw down that deep? They literally emotionally just struggled with it and still are because we haven't capitulated that much yet. Yeah. Well, the people that I see that struggle with that are it's either one of two things it's one they just don't have a strategy and they're just buying and hoping and they don't know where they're buying and why and they don't have a plan for all the outcomes right the other is they're trading with too big of position sizes they're like they talking about you know the uh, trading in the zone one thing mark douglas talks about is how you have to truly accept the risk of whatever you're buying and like hope is not a strategy and if if you buy anything could be bitcoin could be a, a house could be a stock whatever and like you don't think about the downside potential before you buy you don't think well what would i do if it crashed by half then you're gonna have regrets when that does happen. So you have to size based on the future risk. And so 
again, going back to it, it's either people that don't have a strategy at all and they're just randomly buying and not thinking about the pullback potential and or their sizes are just too big and they can't stomach that paper drawdown looking at that looking at their you know their block folio going oh my god i was a millionaire now i'm not you know like if you find yourself doing that you've got to fix that yeah right and don't feel bad if you've done that recently we've we all started there somewhere i think a lot of it too is people that are newer in crypto they don't realize the volatility like they know it's <clears throat> volatile but they don't really realize what that actually feels like until they go through it yeah and then they realize oh my gosh, that was terrible. Maybe I'm not meant for holding this type of asset in, 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 in this capacity. And either they size down or you know diversify into other things and try to have a portfolio that's not so volatile, they end up recalibrating for their actual risk tolerance. But sometimes until we go through that process and have our first huge drawdown, we don't really know our risk tolerance yet. That's, that's a good point. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that a lot of people that are new and freaking out about this understand that this is all part of the process of you uh, really tu tuning into yourself and learning yourself. It's pretty normal. I mean, I think we've all gone through that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a learning process. Yeah. Trav, you're being pretty quiet. What are you thinking over there? No, I'm, I am think you're, you're making great points. I, uh, as Charlie Munger says, I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, there's definitely a lot of really valuable lessons that have happened recently. And I just want to say, like, anybody that didn't trade or, or play this last six months like you would have wanted to, either you didn't buy early and heavy enough or you didn't sell at the right time or whatever it is, like, hey, it's okay because... The first thing we always like to say is there's always another opportunity. Like the markets aren't going anywhere. There's always another trade. There's always another good buying time. So learn from your mistakes and try to improve for the next time. And what else? <laughs> I mean, there's still time. Like, yeah, it's not like the yeah, market, it's not like the markets are done. Uh, yeah, it's not like the markets are done, and it's not like the markets have bounced all the way back to the highs you know yeah. we're still down yeah. we're still price is still finding its way from here and trying to figure out what direction we're going to go i say pay attention to price from here on out have your capital ready and it's not too late for you yep and then you know the the one thing i i would also add that can help with kind of the mental side of when to get in is have rules-based trade setups like no like where you're getting in and be able to quantify your edge and if you can't do that you don't have an edge period yeah. um and always prepare for all sides upside downside sideways <laughs> yeah all yeah think it. like a chess player right like map out like what if the market goes up what if the market goes down and what if it chops around what would i do in any one of those scenarios yes and that way you're not surprised by what the market will throw at you people don't realize the power that holds just envisioning it going into your mind and just envisioning all of these things playing out all of these different ways yeah and how you would feel if these things happened but it takes work and it takes being introspective yeah and a lot of people you know have a hard time doing that you just have to train yourself mm -hmm. don't expect perfection exactly you know perfection is not what the name of the game is here trading yeah. exactly. investing whatever it is that your strategy is focused around almost never will you pick the exact bottom and the exact top and expecting perfection is only going to lead you to emotions that are going to damage your p l mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. you're you're going to make they we talked jared talked a lot about it in the class today in the community and when we when he was addressing the middle side of trading but you know there's there really should never be an expectation of perfection in investing and trading. Yeah. I, As Rocky says, profits over perfection, right? Yeah. Like uh, my goal is not to pick tops. Sometimes it happens that I do nail the top, but you shouldn't be focused on that. Focus on getting the meat of the move. I need that on a hat. Meat of the move. Yeah. <laughs> like, what the heck does that mean? Yeah. I, I do like, uh, yeah, profits over perfection. That'd be a good shirt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Alchemist says dry powder is un and dry powder is an underrated weapon, and I agree. Yeah. Yes, 
but but <laughs> but too much of it you're missing out potentially yeah that's the hard part with cash right uh i typically run my portfolio anywhere between 10 to 20 percent cash at any at any given time 20s on the high side frankly but there's a trade-off there hold too much cash too long it's a headwind for your overall portfolio return have no cash you know at the wrong time and you won't be able to take advantage of really interesting you know market opportunities right so there's a trade-off there between that optionality that cash gives you and the headwind that cash cash gives you it's a delicate <laughs> dance yeah but i would say it's okay to always have like like you said at any given time you may have anywhere from you know eight to 12% or whatever cash. And it depends too. Like you said earlier, if you are running a trading strategy with a shorter term, more active strategy versus a longer term, you'll have more invested, cash. Yeah. Versus, yeah more yeah. passive strategy. Right. So, so it just depends on yeah. your situation and your style. You got to yeah. find that number that makes the most sense that fits in that sweet spot between optionality yeah. and headwind from too much cash. So it's kind of like a trader, short term trader could be in like 50% cash tomorrow you know, and like mm -hmm. that wouldn't be abnormal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, but that would be very abnormal for a long-term investor. That's way too much cash. Yeah. Most so hedge fund portfolios run at usually anywhere from 80 to 120 gross exposure. And um, yeah, or it really even probably, I would say more often equity hedge funds, you'll see at a hundred to 200% gross exposure and like, you know, basically 90 to 120 net exposure. Because they're using leverage, right? Yeah. yeah. Or running a short book versus a long book. Yeah. Know, which inherently has some leverage. That's why I like thinking about um, capital buckets, right? Because my, like, my cold storage capital bucket is always 100% invested in Bitcoin and Ethereum and maybe a handful of others. That's always invested, right? And I'm only adding to that. The capital only flows one direction. My cycle trades that are, you know, six to 24 month positions, that's anywhere from, man, on the low side, 30% invested. So I, I've been as high as like 70, 75% cash all the way up to like 95% invested, less than 5% cash, right? That range is big time. And then my short-term capital, yeah, I don't do a whole lot of short-term trading anymore. Like I find the longer my positions the longer i hold the more money i make and the less i do you know that's why my motto is trade less profit more you know day traders virtually all of them lose money now uh swing traders you can make great money in the right market environments and then ca capturing the multi-year cycles in bitcoin has been the most profitable thing i've ever done right so like there i think having a mix and just knowing where the opportunity is and then making sure your mental game is on point so you can max, uh, maximize those opportunities. I think that's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. All right. Well, should we move on? I know we've got actually quite a bit of news to talk about, both in the crypto space and in stocks and some uh, some questions for, that we had submitted through the website. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right, let's go ahead and jump in. I So, you know, price aside, which obviously, you know, everybody just loves to talk about Bitcoin's price. And I'll just tell you guys right now, like I, I'm using what I call my box strategy. So I'll just look at the chart real quick and then we'll talk about the news and stuff. But we get to these moments where I call them like 50-50 zones where I just don't know what's going to happen. And instead of trying to guess, what I do is I frame price and I look at the bull and the bear case and like what I would do in any scenario. So like right now we've had a big sell off, obviously from the, the right shoulder, uh, which is where I sold. Uh, we came down what about f right at 50% um, from the pivot high in uh, early May. And then right now we're kind of hanging out under the 200 period moving average. So we, we've got support down around 34 K we've got resistance at 40 K and we're kind of in this zone. And so what I've done is I've created a plan for myself where it's like, I know what I'll do is if we break up above 40 K, I know what I'll do if we break down below 34 K instead of trying to guess, I just kind of create these like indecisive zones and usually most of the time when i when i know we're in one of these ranges price just chops around anyway so mm -hmm. it's not even worth trying to overanalyze yeah it could get real boring from here for a while yeah and then and if not if it breaks up or down i have a plan of exactly what i'll do and yeah you know talking about the mental side that removes a lot of the emotion and the chasing and the guessing it's honestly interesting to me that bitcoin's price didn't reverse stronger 
you know, I was almost expecting it to bounce a lot harder than it has. Yeah. And that kind of tells me that now, after what happened, maybe people are feeling a little bit fearful. They're unsure. Mm -hmm. You know, trepidation is going to lead to consolidation. Yeah. Then we break a zone one way or the other. The market finds confidence again. The cycle repeats. repeats. Rinse and repeat. Yeah. Yeah. The disciplined smart money will continue to make money and the emotional capitulators will always transfer their money to the, the patient. Um, awesome. All right. Let's talk about some stuff. Uh, a couple days ago, Michael Saylor met with a couple of Bitcoin miners. I don't really have anything to add to this other than it's not really, I think, of a big of a deal as people were making it. You know, obviously the the billionaire that shall not be named on this show anymore <laughs> <laughs> was uh, was saying some really ridiculous shit about Bitcoin being bad for the environment. We talked at length last week about all that situation. Um, so anyway, I, I just think it's good, you know, with all the China FUD and the Elon FUD and stuff. Oops, I said it. Wait, can I ask a question? Yeah. Is, is there really a mining council coalition organization? No, or is this it's not just, official. It's what just, is this? So uh, it, what's funny is like some of the OG miners that I've been following from some of, the, you know, the early days in crypto, they're like, some of them were raising their hands. They're like, I wasn't even part of this conversation. So I don't know. I don't, I don't really care. I'm not in the mining game uh other than like you know the old miners that i played around with a little bit but i i just think that china stepping in and saying like hey we're gonna ban you know we're just reminding everybody that we've banned mining and we're banning this and that it's like great let's get more bitcoin control out of china i think it's a net positive and there, there are other smart people that have said that you know m people that are much more informed on the mining side than i am but i just think it's a net benefit and i i this is just fud in my opinion okay what interesting timing right what interesting timing where Elon comes out and is is uh, complaining about the environmental impact, which he, by the way, knew about months before when he yep. bought Bitcoin. But he starts complaining about it, and then a week or two later, uh, the area that is probably the biggest concern from an environmental perspective, Chinese miners, end up perhaps being forced to shift outside of that country and move to other sources of you know electricity. And so... Um, you have on the one hand, people were freaking out about this environmental issue. And then literally a week later <laughs> it gets addressed. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like you shine a light on the issue and then the issue is getting fixed pretty quickly. Yeah. 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 I love it. That's, that's a good point. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this company. It's a little company called GameStop. Oh, huh. there's been no drama around their it's stock recently. Yeah. Stock. It's GameStop. Stonk. <laughs> Game stonk. Isn't that the new name? For well, it guess what, guys? They're building an NFT platform as part of their ambitious plan to transform itself into the Amazon of gaming. And GME is actually looking like it they, might. They gotta do something to squeezy, justify squeezy. their valuation, right? Yeah, uh, I, I think this is dope. Actually, I, I think it's it's a you know one of the use cases that could actually be more sustainable than just like you know short-term kind of digital art hype and we again we've talked at this uh, talked about this at length so we don't have to go into a ton of detail but i just think this is another step in the right direction and it's kind of interesting timing for uh, all the GameStop hodlers right now what do y'all think of the naked short theory i don't know Ke kevin we got to bring kevin on the show he's the most he's more <laughs> versed know, in it than what, we are that's what everybody keeps telling me yeah i don't know what do you guys make of this trav any comments i think it's still so early i mean um it's it's interesting that the you know the stocks are reacting so positively and uh, it's it's just so funny that these things have been continuing. I mean, I thought I thought by now the whole the whole excitement over the short squeeze and over GameStop generally would would fade away. But uh, kudos to them for trying to push you know some new avenues of growth. But it's still so early. Like yeah. they're they're literally hiring the team, so we don't know what the product looks like. We don't know how it gets monetized. We don't know you know what kind of a a product it's going to be the fact that they're calling it the amazon of gaming is kind of silly i don't even know what that means to be honest um <laughs> what does that mean like yeah um does that just mean they're like the largest most dominant player i think a marketplace for nfts maybe um but I, I don't know i have a lot of questions still so i think it's still early so i think um 
I'm I'm applauding what they're what they're doing in, in terms of the direction they're headed, but I think it's still so early. I don't know if um, I don't know if the market's right about rewarding this with you know a, a couple hundred million dollars of value. It might be a little bit ahead of itself, so we'll see. Yeah, it's 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 interesting timing with you know the fight between the naked short selling and Wall Street bets, and I, I think any positive news when you have a lot of emotion behind a stock or a crypto is going to send it flying high or crashing pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a classic story stock. You know, you get a positive headline. The same thing happened, I think, with like Virgin Galactic last week. <clears throat> you know, they finally started moving towards a launch. And, you know, it's just been a series of a comical errors there at that company. And, uh, you know, you've got to you've got to get these story stocks have to deliver at some point. Right. Or yeah. they fade away into oblivion. So that's the thing. In the short term, they can be great trading vehicles and. You know, who knows, 10 years out, maybe it is the quote unquote Amazon of gaming. But in the short term, there's a lot to that they have to prove. Exactly. Yeah. We'll see who they hire. We'll see what kind of product they develop. Um, but like I said, I think it's I think it's I think it's good that they're heading in a, in a new interesting direction to try to open up avenues of digital growth. So we'll see. Yeah. Awesome. There, I mean, there is so I will say this, you know, GameStop has a collectibles business that has been part of their DNA for a number of years. And so if there is a, a, an older school brick and mortar player that has some legitimacy to step in, I think GameStop is one of those, you know, they have mm -hmm. a pretty sizable collectibles business that's been running through their brick and mortar shops. And so, uh, I do think, I do think they have some credibility here. So let's see what they can do. Hell yeah. Yeah. We're in the early days of the NFT stuff. It, you know, like I said a couple months ago, like it was kind of the first hype cycle of yep. NFT. Actually, the second, because the first was Crypto Kitties, but, you know, this is the first one that really kind of went mainstream. And so, as predicted, you know, trading volumes and, and prices have come down pretty deep. And so, the next wave of NFTs is where I'm really interested in deploying more capital because then we'll hit the, pl the plateau of productivity and the sustainable stuff will really start to show itself. So, the next, I'd say, one to three years are going to be the time for NFTs to show what they can do. Yeah, absolutely. We've got next up a uh, Wall Street Journal opinion piece that is totally unbiased and <laughs> completely rational. It says, ban cryptocurrency to fight ransomware. The existence of Bitcoin and the, the rest benefits nobody except criminals and speculators. Oh, wow. Woo, so much oh, to tear boy. apart on this. Unpack that, big boy. Right? Uh, looks like they got several hundred comments. So this obviously got some clicks and some eyeballs. Um, I guess kind Is of it an argument against like, cause they'll take cryptocurrency to get their data back instead of cash. It's easier to do Bitcoin. Yeah. For so, so I, I, I think like there, there's a couple things to unpack here. Number one saying ban crypto to fight ransomware is like, okay, well let's, ban cell phones to stop terrorism let's ban coke to coca-cola <laughs> <laughs> let's ban soda let's and ban uh, big max big max to, to fight obesity. obesity uh what else can we ban cars to stop to fight car crashes car crashes right <laughs> it's like here's this unbiased tool that some people use for bad so we should ban it if anything it actually uh, shows how good of a tool Bitcoin actually is. Um, and the other point I'll make here is that ransomware people were using other means of payment before Bitcoin. So thinking that banning Bitcoin is going to stop ransomware is not true at all. Even in the article, I think they even pointed out that they were, yeah, look, uh, attackers uh, before cryptocurrency, attackers had to shell up, uh, Blah, blah, blah. Set up shell companies. There we go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Had to, to basically get credit card payments or prepaid cash cards. So scammers will find a way. It's just that Bitcoin is the best way of payment. So if anything, it adds legitimacy to how good of a tool Bitcoin really is. And thinking that you can ban it just because some bad people use it is terrible. And then the third thing I'll say is we know that criminals much more prefer the dollar to Bitcoin anyway. So... I don't know. That's yeah. not traceable. That's my rant. <laughs> what, what do you guys think? Should we ban crypto because there's ransomware? 
Tell no. me why I'm wrong. No, and I try to stay out of the opinion pages on on uh, media <laughs> sites for for this reason because yeah. it's just such an absurd argument, and you know the opinion pages are full of absurd arguments. Sadly, yeah, um, yeah, that's ridiculous. That's like you know, it, it reminds me of a lot of uh, the attacks that people levied at crypto early on with the whole dark web stuff and. That it was just used as a means for dark web transactions, which of course it wasn't. You know, that was a small component of it early on. But you know, it's like, uh, you know, there, there's a, there's a whole set of things that it's doing good for the world, and we'll, and and obviously even more things that can be done with cryptocurrency in the future that will benefit society. So why would you take a very small thing that's a problem that is not even really directly a, um, a you know caused by crypto? Yeah, it's just silly. Yeah. Silly. It, I always like to point these out and talk about them because, you know, I'm sure, you know, people that are educated in crypto, they know that this is ridiculous. But, you know, what what do you do if you have a family member ask you this? Right. Like, what's the counter argument? So I think it's good to talk about. Yeah. Haters going to hate. Haters going to hate. I mean, what is ransomware as a percentage of all Bit Bitcoin and crypto transactions? 0.001% or something? Yeah. Right? I mean. And, and the fact that this person was so bold to say that it benefits nobody except criminals and speculators. Well, I have several real world examples of how Bitcoin has literally saved lives. Yeah. Some I can talk about, some I really shouldn't. But it is, it's, it's a tool. It's an unbiased tool. And it helps people that really fucking need it. It sounds like this was written more so by an uninformed writer. Right. Like yeah. someone who really doesn't know the space. Right. And okay, boomer. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, the reality is like I feel bad for a lot of journalists because they just have to write stuff to get clicks nowadays. And that's why you've got to really have your media filter on when you're doing anything. Great point. <laughs> yeah. Next up, U.S. home sales fell 6% in April after a big March gain. We've actually got a Y Charts, which, by the way, this show is brought to you by Y Charts. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the sponsorship, Y Charts, which is a cool tool for fundamental analysis on like the economic side and stock screeners and stuff like that. But if we take a look at this, you know, it's interesting when you look at a long term chart. And then you you put that in context, and then you read a headline like yeah, this, right? Exactly. U.S. home sales fell five point nine percent in April after big March gain, and then you look at kind of the long term, and it's like, yeah. oh, it just it pulled back a little bit for a couple of reasons. What what were those reasons? I mean, I think that it has a lot to do with probably stimulus rolling off. It probably has a lot to do with just the fact that things got so overheated that things are normalizing again, and I expect that to happen across. A bunch of different industries yeah including retail um probably has a lot to do with lumber uh i imagine people are trying to maybe people are giving up on trying to fight for houses yeah part <laughs> of it's a supply issue these these are this is volume of homes sold not prices though yeah that, that's, that's a good point out. um so this is new single family houses sold which another thing that could be uh causing this is because of the lumber shortage i know builders some builders that i've talked to said they've actually stopped new home sales altogether because they think prices are going to keep going up and because they just can't forecast lumber prices so this is totally not surprising i have we looked at average home price data has that come out this month uh, i haven't looked i haven't seen that i mean it's been going up for yeah, median home oh, prices should be out. Uh, I'll take a look. Yeah, we can quick. we can look at that. I'd I'd be curious. All I know is here in Central Texas, prices aren't slowing down, and they just keep getting more and more ridiculous. So uh, we we've talked about this a lot, how it's like localized. Yeah. But uh, in general, you know, even looking for certain pieces of property, like down in South Texas and stuff, that I've been looking at, like it's just hard to hard to compete right now. Yeah, I mean, even I, th I, don't, I think even existing home sales are starting to come down, too, because that's new home, right? Yeah. Yeah. I just think things are going to start to level out. I mean, if you look at how elevated things got in 2020, going into 2021 it can't necessarily sustain forever. Yeah. So I mean, we saw this back in the early days of the, you know, early 2000s real estate boom, like people started chasing. It's the same thing as like a para parabolic pump and dump pattern, right? Like people start speculating. There was a, a recent story here in Austin where uh, a house listed for 600 K um, it got multiple offers. It got bid up to like seven or 800 K the 
owner pulled the listing, repriced it, relisted it at like 850. A quote unquote investor, aka speculator, stepped in, offered 950 cash, and then is now trying to rent the place out for like 6,500 a month. I'm talking like a normal middle class family house. Wow. So once the speculators start doing that, when they get a certain piece of the pie, that's where the top is created because they compete with each other and they create the top. Yeah. So I don't know how far away from that we are, but we're getting, I think, pretty damn close. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's hard to say, like specifically in certain areas like Austin, um, but I imagine I imagine that, that there's going to be a degree of that happening even here. Yeah. Eventually. <laughs> Yeah, you well, would think, but the pendulum's going to swing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, cause it went so far. Yeah. I mean, I know Californians have a lot of money, but I mean, sheesh, I feel like eventually it's going to have to come in a little bit. Yeah. And taking a look at lumber prices. So we had the, the breakout from, you know, basically the 900 or a thousand bucks ran straight up to an all time high around 1700 and it's pulled back a little bit. We're around 1300, but it's still kind of unclear. I, I don't know if this is just a pullback in the meta trend or if this is going to V top eventually the, you know, as commodities usually do when they break out of a range, there's usually a V top and then a crash as suppliers start to flood the market with more supply. Mm -hmm. So that's, really kind of what I'm looking for is yeah. I don't know where the top's going to be but eventually it will tweezer top. Let us not forget that commodities are pretty volatile as well. Yeah. You know, I mean they they can have big price swings, percentage moves. So Yeah. Absolutely. That wouldn't surprise me. Yep. To see something like that eventually. All right, next up, small caps take the lead in broad stock rotation. What do you guys want to say about this stuff? It's 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 tough because you could you could write this headline differently every other week over the past couple of months. Like, yeah. Uh, generally, small craps have, you know, been underperforming over the past month or two. Um, after the the, in in stocks at least after the balloon was deflated a little bit after we got out of that you know kind of crazy period that we were in in January and February, and small caps got got taken down along with growth stocks and spacs, but. We did see over the past week or two a return to some of the some of the growth stocks, some of the SPACs, and some of the small caps. And so, you know, like I said, this headline, if you were looking at this three weeks ago, would have read small caps still lagging the broad market, right? Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if we're we're flipping the trend on a you know medium or longer term time frame yet. It remains to be seen. Um, I, I yeah, I don't know. I mean. Small caps and growth stocks have done well in the past two weeks, but we could be in a totally different environment in a week or two from now. Yeah, I, th this is why, I, especially in the crypto space, like I don't really watch price articles at all because really all that is is somebody doing the the same headline of X market does X insert reason right yep. and it's never the real truth it's just something to get clicks but i just thought it was kind of interesting because there have been so many different narratives in the stock market over the past year mm -hmm. you know it was when COVID hit work from home stocks then it was you know what are reopening we, stocks reopening stocks <laughs> yeah. yeah reflation trades now it's like i don't know what's the what's the big narrative right now or is there one is it kind of have things kind of leveled off to an equilibrium the big narrative through the spring was concerns about inflation that was one of the things that kind of killed the growth stock rally and now the bond markets have really started to level out and so there's been some slow toes being dipped back into the growth waters and into the small cap waters and it's still too early to say um, i am noticing for instance though some of the SPACs that are now going to deal completion the ones that announced deals like about three months ago and that are about to actually finalize their deals those stocks have started to trade up so uh, that could be an early sign as well that a lot of investors are starting to return back to the trade that they were in basically for the last two or three years before people started to worry about inflation in the spring. Uh, on the flip side, you know, could we get data on the CPI later this month or next month that freaks people out again about inflation? Absolutely. So I, we're in a kind of a choppy period, similar to what you were saying about crypto. I think in stocks, we could see a pretty choppy summer with investors 
coming back into growth and momentum and then going back out on bad headlines and a bond yields rip. So we're in, we're in a bit of a chop phase. I, I feel yeah. it's gotten a lot more difficult than last year. A lot of the, the theme based investing, um, that was very clear last year, right? COVID stocks, then it was reopening stocks and then it was the SPAC trade. Uh, there's not really a clear trade or place to be from a factor perspective, in my opinion, right at this very moment. Gotcha. I would agree with that. I would say assuming inflation is just short term and assuming the Fed sticks to its guns and keeps rates low through 2023, I would think that there's a play in growth potentially. It's just a lot riskier now. Yeah. I mean, you're still a lot of it is still trading at super high valuations. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I, but I guess that's like kind of where I've been looking assuming all of those things stay in place if inflation like you said prints high and the market gets spooked again that will all be turned up on its head so i would agree that it is kind of hard to find a factor right now yeah i would say maybe like yeah i don't know i, I was gonna go for maybe just like stick with the high quality good balance sheets maybe quality dividend payers um the the growth that is showing value within the growth, which how do we? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that no, sounds, yeah. Right. It sounds growth weird. at a reasonable price. Growth right. at a reasonable That's what it's price. referred to as. Yeah, find the growth outliers that are trading at lower valuations than their peers. Things like that. That's where I'm I'm at. Yeah, yeah, Makes that's sense. that's pretty much point spot on with how I've been thinking about it is that balanced portfolio between some value stocks, some special situation stocks, some growth stocks that are priced like very reasonably relative to like their sector or their peers. Uh, so we had a couple of new positions over the last two or three weeks. Um, they look like they're working pretty well so far. <laughs> but we, nice. we specifically were looking at stocks where the fundamentals like the revenue growth rates actually accelerated in this past quarter mm. so their their fundamentals are actually getting better on an accelerating basis and you had price come down a lot and you had those valuations if you look at price to sales or price to cash flow or whatever they were trading at below um you know below the range of their peers or their other growth stocks and so that to me is a, is a way to kind of play that trend if it comes back without taking on too much risk you know and not getting into like the story stocks that aren't going to have revenue for five years. Yeah, uh, that mm. is still something I'm I'm not really that interested in right now. You mean you're not buying Virgin Galactic and Nikola? <laughs> the space <laughs> stocks are so interesting to me. The space stocks, um, there's actually quite a few new ones that are coming public via SPACs, but uh, there's so much unproven business model risk there to me. Um, I want to like be really interested in some of these like um, Astra. And, you know, uh, who's the other rocket lab and, you know, some of these new new space companies that are actually um, committing to doing launches. But what do the economics look like on that five, 10 years from now? What, a, you know, yeah, capital intensive. Yeah. AF. How much capital are they going to it, it sounds like maybe like just a a higher reward, higher risk airline play. Like because yeah. that's, that's how they're going to take decades to play yeah, out yeah, yeah like i don't know basically. how you invest in that other than if you get like a in a vc round super early yeah like I, on a public stock where you're not gonna have a lot of revenue for decades you trade it yeah. you don't invest it trade that's, yeah that's trade the point. hype yeah. yeah you could maybe um if you had a trading strategy around yeah. it it's interesting i had a buddy talk to me about he's like listen spacex is in the private market right now private markets valued at like 90 or 100 billion and you know rocket lab is one of the other companies that's had successful commercial launches already and they're you know spacking at a four billion dollar valuation you know this, this there's got to be some value here yeah. and i'm like well i mean first of all private market valuations can get chopped in half quickly yeah when things aren't going <laughs> yeah, well Yeah, the public market's humble <laughs> yeah uh, second of all you know we don't know what spacex's numbers look like we don't know there's a lot we don't know obviously comping them one to one or apples to apples probably doesn't make sense but uh then you look at rocket labs numbers and you're like well i you know they're gonna burn cash for the foreseeable future and i don't know like how, i don't know if it's gonna be worth 10 billion or zero <laughs> like i i don't know like yeah I, that's one of those that's just like in my too hard pile right now i just I hear Richard Branson in the back of my head going, 
you know how you become a millionaire is you start with a billion and then you start an airline, <laughs> yeah. right? Like that's all I'm yeah. thinking of this space stuff. I'm like, yeah. the, people are going to lose a lot of money. Like there's going to be like probably uh, some devastating blow ups and some loss of life and like regulatory action. And like, how do you navigate that? Or how do you predictively invest in that? Yeah. It just seems crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Rocket Lab literally, I think last week had one of the rockets blow up. They were trying to carry some satellites up into space and <laughs> they, their launch blew up. And, you I mean, know, that's going to happen. Payload was lost. Yeah. A lot. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I'm just going to buy Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> Bitcoin to the risk to reward Lemon. there is probably better at this point. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's 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 do some Q&A. Um, guys, feel free to throw some questions in the chat. We also had a few that uh, we pulled from the website. Go to WeTalkMoney dot com submit a question for the show uh dj was asking i'm wondering what value you three feel that traders add to the world i've been trading full-time for about eight months and can't shake this feeling that i'm not providing value to anyone or anything besides my personal financial freedom i have big plans for philanthropy in the future but the road to get there has been uh, really only been rewarding financially uh, love you guys and the and your producer, of course. Awesome. Thanks for the question. I think that's a valid question. I'm sure we've all felt that at times. That's that's why I left the hedge fund industry. You know, I felt like I, this really speaks to me because I had this nagging feeling. You know, when I was working at the hedge fund, that you know, all all we were essentially doing was, and we were very good at it, but we were making rich people richer. And you know, I, I thought about what was I contributing to the world. And a couple things I would say here is one, you're, you're an individual. It's not like you're making Carl icon more money or something <laughs> like that. Right? Like people that don't need it. You yourself are trying to build wealth for yourself so that you can go out and do other things and, uh, and you can, you know, make things happen in the world that you want to happen. And it's hard to make that. It's hard to do that if you don't have capital to do that. Right? So, on an individual basis, I think it's it's a little bit different than thinking about like if you were running a big billion dollar hedge fund, you know, making a bunch of millionaires more rich, right? Yeah. If you're trying to put yourself in a place where you have the funds to be able to do greater things, then I don't I don't see anything wrong with that at all. And I think you should not be so hard on yourself. Yeah. Um and also along the way you can do things. You can contribute to organizations with your time, with your money. Um without you know totally setting yourself back and so you can do things along the way that give back and and honestly sometimes it's just as simple as like raising kids the right way right and and giving the world um you know good values that that's something that can change the world over time yeah there's a, shockingly a shortage of people who are giving good values to the world right and, and showing by example so um don't be so hard on yourself it's a great answer well said yeah. trav what would you say, Nick? I mean, there, I can't add a whole lot to that. Um, the only thing I'll say is I would, uh, yeah, like think about the fact that you want to be uh, giving to charities and you want to be doing that eventually, but what good are you without money if you can't do that, right? So the vision and the goal is to be able to do that, but you just have to focus right now on you and your family and, and your bank account so that you will have that capital bid to be able to make that change in the world eventually. Yeah. Yeah. I think those are great answers. Uh, the one thing I would add is that's why we teach. I think, uh, that's how I kind of give back and also stay engaged. And, you know, we have the community. It's like, uh, we could just trade and invest and either raise capital and have a fund or just manage our own finances. And that's great, but I really enjoy helping other people and, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. So if all I did was trade to me, that would be really boring. So mm -hmm. I need something else to do. Um, I also like investing in early stage startups. Cause I, I feel like th there's a difference between trading and investing and our, and our buddy Colin Roach will talk about this, right? Like investing is taking capital that somebody's actually going to use to build a business, right? That's like startup investing like they literally take your dollars and go buy pens and hire employees and computers with it right where investing in the stock market that's the secondary market so you're buying someone else's equity that's more of a way of saving you know you're speculating you're trading but you're really saving that that capital isn't going to quote unquote productive use so anyway long way of saying like i think it can be helpful 
to do other things outside of trading. If it's philanthropy, if it's starting another business, if it's raising kids, whatever, you don't have to identify how you get your money as your worth in the world. You can use that capital for good as I try to do. And I think we all do is like, look for other ways to contribute. And if trading is a means to that end, cool. Well yeah. said. Yeah. And oh, and by the way, trading and investing does not have to be a zero sum game. If you're if you're like day trading futures, then yeah, that's probably a zero sum game. <laughs> but if you're investing in Bitcoin or investing in stocks, like you can make money and grow wealth without having to take that from somebody else. Yeah. Trading yeah. altcoins, yeah, you're probably taking that from less disciplined people that FOMO into stuff, but investing in Bitcoin and growing that ecosystem and showing people what Bitcoin can actually do for the world, th that actually has a net positive effect on the lives of everybody that's in it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, next question. Kina was asking, uh, how much experience do I need to join your wealth building community? I'm pretty new to stocks and don't know if it'd be above my head. Yeah, what would you guys say about somebody who's interested in stocks in the community? I mean, we have resources that you would get access to that kind of help you build that foundation. Yeah. Trav, I know you've got a course um, that they would get mm -hmm. with the membership that kind of helps build that foundation in, in fundamental stock world. And then I've got a course in there um, that gives the basics of investing as well. There's a course in there called Maximize Your Money, and I cover invest, investing basics, uh, stock market basics, passive investing, ETFs, things like that. Yeah. Um, so I would say that you would be able to definitely get what you need, even if you're a beginner. Okay. And we have the mental mastery course in there as well. That'll, yeah. um, most people go through that once they've had a loss or two and are feeling a bit <laughs> down, but if you want to do it the right way, go through that yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, the mental mastery I think is huge for people that once they get in the markets and they're like, oh, this isn't like printing money every single day all the time. It's like, you gotta manage risk. Yeah. And how do you do that? It's a skill set. Yeah. Um, cool, yeah. Uh, I saw a couple people asking about the promo code that we did last week. So I'll just mention it now and then we'll do live Q and A. Um, so if you go to wetalkmoney.com forward slash community, the promo code is spring21. And then that's 50% off your first membership tuition. So for anybody that was, I, I got a few emails and tweets and stuff this week too about that. So feel free to plug that in. And as Nikki was saying, the bonus course in there is the mental mastery course. So kind of, you know, on today's topic of the, the mental game, you would get access to that as well. Mag, mag, mad morgue is saying courses in where, and we have a members area. When you join, you get access to the members area. That's where the course is. Yeah. Housed. Yeah. Uh, Kev, if you want to show the screen, I'll, I'll just um, show this again. And then for anybody that's watching this later, we'll leave the, that promo code up for a few days. But this is what the, the page looks like. And you guys can read through everything that's in the community and all that good stuff. But uh, all right, let's do some q and I saw Mr. Smith was asking any information on how the spike in lumber, et cetera, have caused significant rate hikes in mortgage insurance for homeowners. Some are up 50 to 60% in the last two years. Are you talking about mortgage insurance or homeowners. homeowners insurance? So mortgage insurance is when you put less than 20% down and somebody needs to insure against the possibility of you defaulting on the mortgage where homeowners insurance protects against loss if there's a fire or a flood or something like that. I'm not aware of any hikes. I haven't bought any homes in the past two years. Um, have you guys heard any stories or? Hikes in homeowners insurance? Yeah, I guess either, either one of them. I, that... I haven't uh, heard of mortgage insurance hikes, but homeowners insurance hikes would uh, that would make sense because it costs more to replace to replace the home. Yeah, if, if, if they are assessing your home's value at higher replacement cost, then that would obviously yeah, increase absolutely. the insurance, the, the total coverage and the premium. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, right now, I mean, I, you should do this every year. You should check to make sure that your uh, homeowner's insurance coverage is enough to actually cover the replacement value as 
you know inflation happens and all these other yeah. things happen the insurance companies are usually pretty good at, at adjusting that but um i always say double check make sure especially with things like lumber going crazy yeah um, yeah because you definitely if you if your house burns down and you need it to get replaced you definitely want it yeah, covered you, yeah. you don't want to have to come out of pocket because lumber's up yeah yeah exactly. That's just an unfortunate result of this shortage situation, and they're probably not going to reverse and take rates down if lumber crashes fifty percent from here. So yeah, you know that's that's just an unfortunate, tough situation. But you know, go out and get a, a several quotes and see if you can make the insurers compete against one another and maybe try to find a better rate. But other than that, yeah, there's just not a ton you can do about about that yeah this is another follow-on effect of actually what causes real estate crashes too or at least what we experienced in the early 2000s was you know people don't think about the variable costs associated with owning a home right they think what's my mortgage payment today let me qualify for the most amount that i could possibly afford today and hope that I just make more money in the future. But then what happens is, you know, even if you buy with a low rate, you're like, I can afford more house. That's what causes prices to go up. But then guess what? Taxes go up. They usually only go one direction. Up. They're yeah. not, they don't usually, you know, municipalities don't usually drop tax rates. Mm -hmm. uh, homeowners insurance goes up replacement costs, maintenance costs go up. So for anybody that's thinking about buying a house, make sure you leave yourself a lot of wiggle room in your budget because what you're paying today is not what you're going to probably be paying in a year or two or three. It's a great point. Yeah. And if you want to build a deck, you are out of luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. There's uh, like, I think there's some fake wood alternatives now that people are starting to use that were usually more expensive, but now are starting to come into parody like tracks and stuff like that. Mm, <laughs> yep. Uh, Chris, what do you think? ETH will outperform Bitcoin this year. Twitter's full of these ETH maxis thinking there's going to be a flipping. Yeah, the flip. Oh, God. God. If I, I hear that word one I more was, time. I was, <laughs> I was joking with these boys early, or earlier talking about the flipping. Yeah. yeah. Look, at the end of the day, I don't know. And I'm not going to claim to know. I'm a trader. I'm an investor. If they both go up, great. If they both come down, that's great too. I don't really try to speculate about what's going to win. Even in like the network wars, you know, with like Tezos and Cardano and all that stuff. I'm like, I'll trade the chart. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to bag hold a large portion of my wealth in that. If ETH flips Bitcoin, great. I've got ETH. If not, I've got Bitcoin. I'm like the least tribalist guy in crypto out there, which you would think I'd be like a Bitcoin maxi because I've been in Bitcoin for so long, but I'm really not. I'm a Bitcoin bull. I'm also an ETH bull. I don't claim that everything that's outside of Bitcoin is a scam, but I also don't claim that ETH is going to flip Bitcoin. I just don't know. <laughs> the more I learn about ETH, the more bullish it's hard like not to be bullish on it yeah i mean it's I got a use case it. yeah and yeah. that's that's one thing that when i look at my bitcoin maxi friends i'm like guys like you're being tribal and you're probably missing out you know i don't know hey, Great point. someone's asking about amc <laughs> <laughs> you we did mention the the meme stocks and the short squeeze stocks from the spring like gme and amc have been popping off uh here in the last couple trading sessions I think AMC is overvalued. Uh, I I am from a fundamental perspective. I cannot make a case for AMC here. That being said, I would be terrified to short it right here. Uh -huh. Yeah, and yeah. you have a couple things. Obviously, from from the long side, working for it, which would include theaters are finally starting to get real movies like A Quiet Place Two. I think comes out this week. Uh, so they're finally starting to get some marquee titles going back into theaters, and I think you'll see you know, people by the fall, at least in North America, returning. And so you're going to have a, a good story being told about the attendance rates going back up. And AMC sold a ton of stock uh, on that. I got to give them credit. The management team, team did exactly what they should have done, which is they sold a massive amount of stock to t when they were taking advantage of the short squeeze. Back here? Yes. Yep, to uh, help pad the balance sheet with some extra cash and to be able to pay down some of the massive debt load that they had on the balance sheet. So um, that was a good decision by them. However, it means that there's way more shares outstanding. So if you were a shareholder with 100 shares of AMC, you now own like one 
third of the amount that you thought you did in terms of percentage ownership, um, you know, if you compared like January 1 versus today. So it makes the upside much more capped on AMC from a fundamental basis longer term. And in fact, if you look at the enterprise value, you take the total value of the debt and the total value of the stock today, the market cap of the AMC, I think it's almost twice what it was before the pandemic started. So investors wow. today are paying twice what they <clears throat> were paying before the pandemic hit for AMC. And that's just absurd, given the fact that the business is probably unlikely to even hit a pre-pandemic peak for a while. So again, for me, from a fundamental perspective, I can't make a case for buying AMC here on a long-term basis, but I also would be terrified to short it. But guys, AMC is going to become the Amazon of movies. <laughs> <laughs> you, you never see, know. You, you never know. Hey, what if they turn into like some VR, like interactive Like you go in place? with a VR headset. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, hell, who knows? Yeah. I, I'm just, in general, I'm bearish on the, the old school movie theater model. But if they reinvent themselves, who knows? Yeah. But again, that's like a, a lottery ticket. I remember being in a, a at a conference with AMC management uh, I was listening to their presentation. This was probably back in, I don't know, 2012 or so. And they were talking about their business. And it was and it was like, and I stood up and I said, you know, how are you thinking about reinventing the business? Like, how are you thinking about adding new food options, more making it more of an entertainment experience? Because, you know, we see some models that are up and coming like IPIC and and Alamo where they're they're offering booze. You can get at theaters and they're making it more of an experience. And it felt to me at the time like, these guys were dinosaurs yeah and they stood up there and they answered my question and they were like well you know we've got a couple of things that we're trialing but like they were like so far behind the curve and i was like these guys are dead they were just fat and lazy <laughs> yeah you know they were comfortable with their model and they're like this yeah. isn't going to change why are people going to stop going to movies yeah well guess what yep yeah and over the last few years they have struggled and not just because of the pandemic they were <clears throat> struggling pre-pandemic um, so they, yeah. need to, they need to reinvent this ex and make it more of a, an experience. I think than it is, they've started to do it, but there's a lot, a lot they can do. Yeah. Well, all fundamentals and rationality out the door, just looking at the price chart, there was a hell of a breakout a couple days I ago, know. Yeah. that $15 price chart or that $15 breakout on the price chart was beautiful. You had kind of an ascending wedge in a resistance. And this is what happens when you have a, a meme stock with a lot of eyeballs and a lot of emotion around it. You and can get high shorted. flyers. Yeah. I'm almost shorted. thinking I need to come out of day trading retirement. <laughs> I mean, Every now and then. Of of 1960 i mean look at that yeah it's gonna be a pretty big breakout if it breaks oh you're talking about the all-time high back yeah then? i mean yeah. if you yeah i don't know we'll see if, if these uh if these meme stocks go crazy again i may have to come out of day trading retirement <laughs> <laughs> every now and then you know I, I don't i don't then. like day trading but every now and then you when get the a sweet right one opportunity comes along you just yeah. have to be so picky oh yeah uh, Nick was asking, do you guys ever have in-person events or meetups? It's funny you should ask that. We were just talking about that. So, yes, the answer is yes, we do. And we're, like, itching to get back into live events because we have so much damn fun with you guys. We have, we've done them in Cayman Islands, Amsterdam, here in Texas. We were looking at Vegas, Miami, like, uh, Bali. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're definitely going to have some over the next year and two. I'm stoked for that. Hell yeah. <laughs> um, more to come on that. We'll have more to announce hopefully in a few months. Are you guys familiar with the crypto tax loopholes? I'm not sure what loopholes you're talking about, but I'm open to anyone that you know about. <laughs> <laughs> they've been closing most of them over yeah. time in the U.S. at least. They've been cracking down. Uh, hey, everyone. How do you guys manage that cold stack of cash, which you don't want to necessarily expose to the market risk, but also don't want to get hit big over time with inflation? Well, that's the balance, right? Yeah. And the way I look at it is like for every million bucks in cash you have, you're losing probably like 30 to 50 grand a year in to inflation. That's kind of how I think about it. So I'm like, that's like, you know, an employee or something, you know, that yeah. you're paying so if you have 10 million in cash, which I know most people don't, but like if you did, the question would be why that's way too much, unless you you're spending shit tons of money. Whereas if you like are 99.9% .9 invested in the stock market and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to like buy ramen noodles tomorrow. That's like the other extreme. So I don't know. How, how do you guys manage that balance of inflation risk versus market risk? 
I mean, the, the way I do it is I've got an amount of cash that I know needs to stay in cash, and I don't care if it loses money to inflation because it's very important for it to be liquid. It's yeah. a business emergency savings, personal emergency savings, and a little extra just in case for whatever reason. For Lululemon purchases. For Lululemon <laughs> purchases. The occasional Abercrombie and Fitch trip. Yes. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how I do it, and then the rest gets invested uh, in some way former fashion and there are ways that you can look right now it's really hard to beat inflation without taking on risk it's just the environment we're in we have to accept it yeah so you either go a little bit higher on the risk spectrum and invest in maybe some corporate bonds or maybe you invest in high quality dividend paying stocks um to try to manage that inflation risk if you don't need the liquidity uh and you can stay invested because the thing is is People need to understand that if you need short-term liquidity or you think you will, if you're in dividend-paying stocks and you're stuck and you need to pull cash out, okay, the stock declines because of whatever reason, because anything can happen in the stock market. You know, obviously there's a, you know, relation between the dividend uh, yield and the stock price. Yeah. And so you don't want to be in a situation where you're having to pull capital out of stocks or bonds at the worst possible time yeah so that's why i like to think think about the look the long term you know time frame that i can actually keep that money invested what also what about like stress testing it where it's like all right let's say i woke up tomorrow and the markets the stock market and the crypto markets and everything i was invested in was down 50 percent how would that affect my cash flow like what would i need more cash because of that or would I be insulated and have enough to survive? Would my business get hit because a market crash is going to cause my car dealership to sell less cars or whatever, right? Like mm -hmm. not just the balance of the portfolio, but how would it actually affect my, would I get fired, right? Like if the market crashed by 50%, would my home builder go under and I no longer have a sales job, right? Would I have enough cash to be insulated for X number of months or years? That's how I think about it too, is yeah. like, like you said, you don't want to sell your assets at the low, but that's what causes market cycles in the stock market is in 28 or 2008, people had to, a lot of people didn't have a choice, but mm -hmm. to sell the lows because they got fired or their job, their business crashed. And they and didn't have an emergency savings. And even though it was maybe losing money to inflation over time, they probably lost even more by having to sell the market at the lows. Yeah. If you think about it that yeah. way. I don't know. I think you what made you an think? important point earlier, though, is like um, you obviously want to have your emergency fund, which probably just sits in, in the most liquid, either straight up cash or some very short term money market fund. Right. Um, but you can have another kind of pseudo cash, a part of your part of your portfolio that is in government bonds or corporate bonds and can earn a little bit of interest, maybe enough to at least break even on inflation. Yeah. And then, of course, above that, then you have your risk capital in stocks, crypto, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, but there's the, um, the opportunity to put, you know, a nice chunk that you might need for maybe not the emergency situation, but if something were to happen in the economy or you lose your job or something like that, it would be, um, money that could relatively quickly be moved from something earning break even, break even returns on inflation to being able to get liquid. Oh yeah. So that, that's kind of how I think about it. Um, yeah, I think people over obsess with trying to to make money on their savings. And really, you kind of just have to chalk it up. Sometimes. You're talking about like liquid cash yeah, savings. Like yeah, like their emergency savings. Oh, how can I, you know, make a bunch of money on this money? And it's like, that that may not be the right frame of thinking. Yeah, that's why, that's why I think about like, I'm, I'm okay paying some money to inflation for that, the ability to be liquid if I need to be with liquid. no with no or low very low yeah. risk. yeah yeah exactly. I'm like I know if the shit hits the fan I've got cash that I'm I'm paying a, a, a fee to have it in cash uh, even if you're in a quote unquote high yield savings oh, right? boy. <laughs> it's your point oh six or uh, whatever it's like not it's under I think it's like 30 basis points yeah or for our European friends they're probably getting dinged now Ugh. negative interest rate I'm I curious if anybody's in here is paying negative interest rates the good news is in in North America at least the brokerages you can I mean you know at least for stocks you can get your money in and out of a brokerage account in two or three days mm -hmm. true sometimes even faster so 
um, that gives you the opportunity to basically put it into a brokerage account and get it relatively quickly if you need it. But yeah, you know, that's not good point. The, the, the one other thing I'll say too, is like gold. Um, I, I don't really look at gold as a speculative asset. I look at it as kind of a cash like thing, but depending on where you are in the world, like in Texas, we have plenty of gold shops where you can go buy and sell at spot prices. When you buy, you're usually paying a 4% premium. So you don't want to be trading in and out of gold, but I think it is a good cash alternative to where over a long enough period of time, you're not going to make as much as Bitcoin or stocks or whatever, but it is going to insulate you from inflation risk. And it is kind of portable if you're going to have like, you know, this much gold, if you not this much, you know, not a massive amount, but I don't know. That's one other option, I guess. Yeah. It can be quite, it can be volatile at times. For sure. For that's sure. That's only, what I said over the, the long. Issue. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. That's the key. Like well, peak to trough that. in, uh, yes, yes, you know, yes. gold's been doing well recently. You know, I, I usually look at a weekly chart, but yeah, from peak to trough from 2011, it was down, yeah, 45%. So it, it doesn't come without yeah. drawdowns, but over, you know, 5, 10, 20 years, right. it's, it could make but sense. But at that point, just be in equities. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, that's if why, you're hold for that long. I don't know, the, the yeah. gold bugs have been so ragey lately yeah. just because they've been getting their ass kicked by Bitcoin. But, you know, I, I still like gold as an option but i only have like i think two percent of my portfolio in it so yeah whatever all right next question joe miller how do you handle emotions when your portfolio reaches meaningful levels specific to your financial situation example like pay off a house retire buy a new yacht this is a great question that i've actually gotten a lot over the past couple of months because we've had so many crypto millionaires in the community <laughs> new people are like i've never had this much money before you know and this is a good time to say we are not financial advisors. We can't give you personalized financial advice, but in general, you know, when somebody reaches a level where it's like, I can change my quality of life with the amount of money I've made, what advice would you guys say? So the first thing I have a little bit of experience with this because I didn't come from money. I came from a family that struggled with money growing up. Um, and then, you know, after a couple of successful years at the hedge fund, you know, I had some, some paydays that were you know, change, change your life meaningful. And so I, you know, I would say there are studies that show this, by the way, that most people who, who get wealthy quickly, uh, tend to have problems because they, their, they, their lifestyle also changes quickly. Lifestyle and, inflation. Yep. Lifestyle inflation. And so, and in fact, that can lead to a lot of unhappiness, um, but it can also lead to people blowing what they, what they earned. And so I think you have to be careful to be slower about changing your lifestyle than the, the rate of the increase in your wealth. I think that's one thing, especially when it happens quickly. One, you want to do some things like maybe pay off any high cost debt you have. Like I paid off my student loans when I got my first big check and that not only felt great, but it also reduced risk. And, uh, and so you want to do stuff like that obviously first, but beyond that you want to maybe take take some time take some time you don't have to like go out and buy a bunch of nice stuff right away and and flaunt it you know there's probably things you're going to want to do longer term that you know may not even be on your radar immediately so um, you can continue to invest it and grow it and i think being cautious and thoughtful about how you how you alter your lifestyle when that first happens when you get wealthy is really important yeah um you can always because right you can always add things later but it's difficult I, i'll tell you there's a really severe mental anguish that comes from people who get wealthy experience the the better lifestyle and then have to pull back from that lifestyle because they did something wrong or the mm. market takes a crash you know something happens and they lose some of that wealth right and they gotta get taken back down a peg that's almost worse than never having experienced wealth at all in some cases like people commit suicide you know uh, not everyone obviously but that those stories are out there so just be really thoughtful and slow about how you change your lifestyle when you get that you know mm -hmm. um newfound wealth i think that's great advice um yeah like that the idea of what is it like 70 or 80 percent of uh lottery winners go bankrupt it you know and we we see this in the wall street bets community like all the the lost porn right where they mm -hmm. post the charts yeah. of massive gains and then just as fast as they made it it came all the way back to zero it's like if you make life-changing amounts of money and you're holding a volatile asset, 
the one thing I always say is like the the whole no regrets trading strategy. That's what right? I was gonna bring so, up. So common common example recently is hey, I bought Bitcoin at X and it went up, now it's worth X. <clears throat> Two questions that I like to ask myself and I propose other people answer for themselves is one, what would I do or how would I feel if price crashed by 50, 60, 70, 80 or 100 percent run every scenario? Would I regret not selling a piece of that up here at this price to do this to do to this buy, pay my house off exactly to, to do Whatever. something with it and then like what is a meaningful amount of money like what what are my big goals right like do I could I buy a house in cash and would that change my life in a meaningful way and is it worth sacrificing potential future gains for this asset uh, Bitcoin or stocks or whatever for this house or this, hopefully it's not a depreciating asset like a car, but like, is it worth giving up the future gains for what I could have now, mm -hmm. right? Paying off debt, buying a house, giving your family money so they can get out of debt, right? Like those are questions that are obviously different for everybody, but it's worth thinking deeply about because if you make the wrong choice, it could lead to a lot of regret later. Yeah. I think that's well said. That's exactly where I was going to go. You're the it. financial planner and I just, you know, totally steamrolled you. What, what no, else would you say? No, you did not steamroll me at all. <laughs> I mean, I was going to bring that exact fact up that yeah. you have to think of everything as a trade. You have to think of everything as like, okay, what if I don't take profit? What, what, what if I don't do this and pay off my house and I could have, and things change, how's that going to make me feel? Yeah. You know? I don't know. I, I think that you nailed it. So I really don't have a whole lot to add to that. Great. Okay, cool. Maybe I could be the financial planner. No, yeah. just kidding. <laughs> Hell no. I mean, yeah, like if I was sitting with somebody, I'd be walking them through that exact process. Yeah. Yeah, I think those are great questions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are having to answer those recently. So uh, what kind of Bitcoin debit cards are reliable? Uh, when you wipe it pulls from Bitcoin versus a checking account. I don't personally use them, but there, there's a handful out there. I'm not going to promote any single one, but yeah, if you want that in your life, get all the most popular ones and test them. Uh, Christian asked me about a stock earlier and uh, yes, I actually own that. That's been a pretty recent ad for me. Which one? And uh, pager duty. Mm. What's the ticker? PD. And uh, yeah, I own it. I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I like the I like stock. it a lot. <laughs> nice. Um, that's one of those. Uh, that's one of those that I was talking about earlier in the in kind of the growth at a reasonable price. And this is not like a. I wouldn't call it like a, a massively cheap stock. It's not trading at eight times cash flow or something absurd like that. It's not a value stock per se. But what I like about it is great product, great CEO. Uh, accelerating growth rate um, stock was down you know from its highs pretty significantly over the past couple of months probably small enough to get acquired by some of the players in the industry or some of the bigger players in software that are adjacent to its product uh, pretty good competitive position not really that many direct competitors in its product niche so yeah a lot of factors there um, good balance sheet nice good team where were you buying around remember? low to mid 30s um, oh, okay. Pretty Maybe much on this low back here. The local low, yeah. Nice. Uh, I think my average cost is about 34 I want to say, but I'd have to double check that. Sweet. But uh, yeah, I think it's potential double in the next two years. So we'll see how it plays out. Cool. Uh, we've been going for over an hour and a half. Okay. I didn't even realize how long it's been. Wow. I was wondering <laughs> why I'm so hungry. All right. We can do one more question and then uh, we'll roll. And uh, I'll actually, I'll throw this back on the screen um, for anybody that didn't catch the promo code. It's spring 21. So we talk money.com forward slash community spring 21. And yeah. Uh, okay. So last questions from Steve, I guess this is like a two part question. What do you think of companies like uh, Mike Novogratz's galaxy digital uh, who aim to be the Goldman Sachs of the crypto world? Is it in, worth investing in crypto infrastructure, custody solutions, venture capital firms, et cetera, as opposed to purely investing in crypto projects. So I think Mike is a super interesting dude. I think he's doing great things for the crypto space. Um, and as far as like, is it worth in investing in infrastructure and custody solutions and all that stuff? That's what I spend several hours of my day looking at every single day is mm -hmm. different potential investments and different ways to participate in the crypto space and add value. And so, 
to each their own adventure is how I look at it. It's like you want to set capital aside that if you are an accredited investor, you obviously get access to, I, get, I would call them higher quality rounds, which I think is complete bullshit. I think everybody, even smaller investors should have access to angel rounds. We've talked a lot about the accreditation rule, which I think is really flawed in many ways. Uh, but my own opinions aside, I would just say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in all the things crypto, but you, you've got to think about downside risk. I'm not cutting checks every day. I'm very, very selective with what I invest in. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't, I haven't looked at galaxy digital, which is public, um, that closely in a while, but, um, I'd have to do some work on that as, as far as the stock is concerned. Um, you just to point out though, obviously it's, it's come down a lot recently with the crypto market volatility. So, you know, if you were thinking about getting in, that's the time you'd probably want to really be sharpening your pencil and figuring out, you know, what price you want to buy at, because you'd love to get stuff like that on sale. And, um, I mean, I guess you could say the same thing about Coinbase, right? Uh, we've had a lot of people in the community asking us to look at that stock and we've kind of given our thoughts on it. Um, it's, it's, I would say generally it's really tough to figure out who's going to win. Um, and there's probably going to be multiple winners. Like you look at stock brokerages, right? You've got E-Trade, Fidelity, you know, eToro, Robinhood, uh, Charles Schwab, all these different players, right? And so there's no one or two dominant players in stock brokerage. And, uh, my guess is it's going to be that way in crypto. It kind of already is. Yeah. And so <clears throat> even more so I'd say. Yeah. Probably, right? Yeah, yep. especially because you've also got, you're competing with DeFi. Uh, so, you know, you've got um, the ability for people to do transactions and swaps through DeFi too. So that that creates a whole competition segment. So it's just really hard to know what five years from now, 10 years from now, what the competitive landscape looks like and to put valuations on those. But uh, like Chris said, if you can find something early enough and get in at a uh, early enough price, like on a, a VC style investment, and it's got a good team, uh, it's got a, a competitive uh, edge, like they're doing something different or new or unique, right? Um, those are those those are ones that I would take a harder look at at least. Yeah, if it has a profit motive, like that there's too. so many crypto projects that I'm like, yeah, you guys are trying to change the world, but how are you going to make money, right? Like mm -hmm. that's why Coinbase did so well, right? Their valuation went from what. 25 million at their seed round to b -b billions now. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I want to get into. Yeah, for oh, sure. Oh, which there was a question I just saw <laughs> that I can't believe we didn't uh, mention this. Is Travis still bullish on an American Bitcoin ETF? Yes. Which, oh. you know, what? what is interesting is... You know, I was I was kind of optimistic of what did I say like Q1 of next year? Yeah, I think it might be longer. Yeah, I I don't th I don't think it's going to happen this year. Um, I, th this question wasn't even for me. What do you think, Travis? <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually agree with you. Um, I think uh, a couple a couple weeks ago we said when do we think it'll happen? I said I think it'll happen by the end of this year, and you said you think it'll be probably early next year. I think you're probably right. I think I'm, I'm starting to change my prediction to be a little bit longer because even though we got a new leader of the SEC, he's unfortunately having to deal with lots of other stuff like the whole SPACs. Uh, you know, like Ginsler was out there this past week talking about uh, needing to step up regulation on SPACs. Yeah. There's just a mm -hmm. lot on the SEC's plate right now. I'm not saying it can't happen this year, um, but if I had to like put probabilities on it, I might actually adjust those now to say, uh, maybe a, a slightly higher probability on next year an ETF getting approved. Yeah. You've, al you've also got crypto being looked at <clears throat> with a finer lens by the SEC right now because of some of the stuff that's been happening in, in the most recent boom. So And the administration, too, yeah. for tax purposes. Yeah. True. So I think that heat might make it more politically difficult for a Ginsler-led SEC to, to approve that this year. And, and one of the challenges that I think the SEC, SEC is looking at is just price stability. And when you have all these like unregulated futures and derivatives exchanges outside the U.S. that sling so much capital mm -hmm. and but they're not really regulated by any meaningful securities exchange commission like that is scary if you even as an investor like who i'm not pro regulation necessarily but i'm like i don't want some shitty exchange in some third world country to be able to crash the price of bitcoin mm -hmm. right like i want that that's the nice thing about you know u.s futures markets like the e-minis 
is like you have price transparency. It's, you know, that you can rely on the price data where when you have like the BitMEXs of the world that were doing all the shady practices they were doing, like it's not a net positive for the crypto ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so I think we do have to get a grasp on some of that stuff before they, before they approve it. Not that I want it necessarily, but I think we're going to have to have that before they'll approve the ETF. Yeah. I think you may be right. Yeah. Yeah. The regulators in the U S are just so slow to move. And, and, you know, I think I was a, a more optimistic because we were seeing filings from the fidelities of the world and the black rocks of the world, and they have lobbying power and money behind them and connections behind them. But even, even with all that, I think they're going to have a, um, a slow slog with the regulators. Yeah. Well, Let's go ahead and wrap it up, folks. Um, before we do, I just want to point out one more comment. It was, Travis, we need more content. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say yes. it, but... Everybody should go to Stock Geek TV's YouTube channel and subscribe and hound him hound to put him. out more YouTube videos. So I'm glad you mentioned that because <laughs> uh, one of the things, and I have too many excuses and, and not enough follow through in the last few months, but... I, I am returning to making content here shortly. Um, one of the things that I had to work through was my studio was actually taken out of commission uh, with some winter storms a couple months ago. Finally got it back in That's order. That's right. It's back. I've got my equipment set up. Um, so it's coming. Uh, the, the, the channel has been dormant, but I, I promise that more content is coming and, uh, that's going to be a big focus for me for the rest of the year. So, all right, we're going to hold you to it. Everybody hound Travis, go subscribe to his YouTube channel. <laughs> um, and yeah, for anybody that wants to join us, go to wetalkmoney.com forward slash community spring 21. will get you 50% off your first membership tuition. Thank you to Y charts for sponsoring the show. Thank you to Nikki certified financial planner and Travis X evil hedge fund guru uh, or mastermind turned to the good side. And thanks to Kevin behind the scenes producing this really long show. And thanks to you guys for sticking here with us for so long. Yes. And we'll see you guys next week. Take care. Take care.